Thank you, David. Um, so uh, I'll just extract a couple of items from the report, if that's OK. I'm conscious also that actually, as described in the report, we have um, a, a relatively new method of contacting the public in terms of the board, which is ask, ask the board questions. Um, and David has a few questions to answer, as it were, uh, which encroach on a couple of the subjects in my in my report. So I I won't steal David's thunder in that regard. But but the items that um, are, aren't relevant, as it were, to to the ask the board questions are firstly, as you'll see within the report, the COVID update is again a positive one. I'm really pleased with how the teams continue to manage and support both our staff and our service users. Um, so the COVID management arrangements remain strong and in place. Risk assessments have been a real priority. Risk assessments for our staff, that is, have been a real priority over the last uh, month. Uh, emerging evidence uh, on a relatively regular basis uh, uh, nationally um, enables us to evolve those risk assessments at a local level, which I'm, I'm pleased with because it, it increases our ability to manage and control risk for our staff. Um, what I'd also mention in terms of planning and management of operations is that you'll be perhaps pleased to know that the flu immunisation programme planning is now in place. Um, even though we are in July, things can move quickly. So um, I'm pleased that we're preempting winter risks in that regard. And also more broadly, winter planning is now uh, actively happening for uh, this coming winter. And Jonathan O'Brien in particular is heavily involved in that and coordinating key aspects of, of that winter planning actually across the systems. So thank you to John and operational colleagues uh, for all of that work. And of course, Kenny's team for the work that we're going to be undertaking on the, on the immunization work. Uh, next, a couple of items around restoration and recovery. Um, so internally, you'll see the report goes to quite a lot of detail, goes into quite a lot of detail about the work that we're doing. We're continuing to operate through two lenses, two focuses, one uh, corporately and the second one clinically, operationally. Um, both are progressing well and are being managed through our program management office. Um, critical to the short to medium term um, management of our restoration and recovery. And because of the fact that we haven't stood down many services, we are quite different to the acute in that regard, is our support for our staff. And what we've put in place are personal plans for um, members of staff, particularly corporate staff, that um, go to the heart of what the requirements are for each and every one of us around whether it be agile working, office working in a safe way. So I'm, I'm really pleased that as an organisation we've um, approached restoration and recovery and uh, evaluation of how we operate going forward in such a personalised way. I know that every organisation you know, nationally hasn't approached, NHS organisation hasn't approached in that way, so I'm really pleased that we've applied that very personal touch to that restoration and recovery work, particularly in relation to our teams. Um, there is in parallel a piece of work that uh, is looking at longer term transformational aspects of our uh, restoration and recovery. So essentially in parallel to the personal plans and the short term management of COVID and staff safety and well-being, we've got uh, transformational work ongoing, which is, is the big ticket stuff around estates, the wider digital conversation that we've just had, which again will come to fruition and evolve through this year. So my expectation is in this calendar year, we will have formulated a set of plans that will very clearly describe the future direction of travel through 2021 and beyond for, for the organisation in terms of the logistics of how we work, how we support our staff and of course in particular our service users. Just remaining briefly on restoration and recovery, the system, uh, as you won't be surprised, is also well uh, on with restoration and recovery work. Some some bigger challenges out there um, to an extent than we have. So restoration of services such as cancer, et cetera, are well underway. But of course, a number of services uh, external to ourselves were stood down back in March. So uh, are required to be 
um, uh, uh, brought back in. So work is ongoing to achieve that. And on top of that, what I would call core restoration and recovery, that the basic bringing back of services uh, as a system, and particularly the ICPs, are developing what I would call more transformational programs of work. I've, I've talked to non-executives about this uh, recently. Uh, those for me are absolutely critical because those are the pieces of work that will um, excite colleagues out there and internally get them to want to um, really come together and build transformational programs of work. And of course, the expectation is that they will massively impact positively on how we provide healthcare across North Staffordshire. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we've uh, pulled together a set of work programmes in the Northern ICP in particular, that I think will um, create that glue across the system to be able to uh, enable us to operate better together, which of course includes general practice. And I'm not just saying that because Keith is on the line. Uh, we've, we've, we've over a period of time reflected on the importance of general practice, primary care network involvement in that, that work. And we're ensuring uh, through colleagues in general practice that we include GPs in all aspects of those ICP programmes. And perhaps the last thing I would mention uh, is the, the final item, which is around our, um, um, our continual evolution of how we engage with uh, the public in particular out there. Um, but it's actually the first item that I want to, to mention, which is our executive drop-ins, our virtual exec drop-ins. So they are digitally based. They started off as being face-to-face, -face, but uh, understandably have become digitally based of late. Since we reintroduced them only probably about a month ago, I would estimate that we've done uh, at least a couple of dozen uh, uh, drop-in sessions with um, probably 100 plus staff on those sessions and they're interactive conversations. So uh, the staff have equal opportunity to ask the executive that's the uh, the exec lead for that conversation questions equally as the executive lead is able to come back to, to the team. So I think it's a fantastic way to um, pull together uh, large amounts of intelligence, understanding on how things are going out there, how staff are feeling, how staff are technically working and operating in this very different environment. And we use that information, we use that information pull it together and have conversations about what next through our senior leadership team. So for me, it's a fantastic resource, source of knowledge and information to get to the heart of how our teams operationally are, are managing at this point in time. Um, I think I'll leave it there if that's OK, but of course, happy as always to answer any questions that people have. Thanks very much, Peter. I'll ask for that. The, the obvious uh, follow on from your last point is uh, that that's great to hear about the drop in sessions. Uh, but as a Ned myself, uh, we're kind of missing out on our drop in sessions. Yeah. Uh, and we need to try and uh, bring those back into play in one way or another and not wait for normality to resume. So perhaps yeah. we can bear that in mind and see what we can do. Yeah. Sorry. Any, anybody else on, on Peter's report? That's quite remarkable. Um, <laughs> Can I just have one very quick question, please, David? Yes, of course. Just very quickly. Um, in terms of looking ahead and planning, and you know, planning in August now, where are we on Brexit planning? Um, or have we got the same degree of preparedness that we had last time in anticipation of a no deal? Now, there we are, Brexit. Hey, I knew it would come back at some point. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I suppose what I would say on that is obviously the focus has been on other things of late, but the, the work that we'd completed up to the point of COVID um, was, in my opinion, robust. I, I think we kept the board well updated on, on progress and that, that progress hasn't changed, I suppose. We still have in the background, all of the contingency plans. Um, we are less affected, uh, as, a man, as I say, mentioned to the board a while ago, we're less affected by Brexit than um, many, if not most, 
NHS trusts, given the number of EU staff that we have, uh, research and development levels, um, although I would like the latter to be a lot higher because we don't have huge amounts of uh, research and development work, particularly linked to the EU and EU funding, we're, we're not heavily impacted. Um, and of course, there are other things like supplies of, of medicines, et cetera, et cetera, from the EU. Um, so the stuff that is in our control, I, I believe we are we still have well in hand. And of course, there is stuff that is not within our control that we can try and mitigate as best we can, but is to a to a large extent in, in the hands of others, NHS supply chain, et cetera. But I'm, I'm pleased with where we're at. I was pleased with where we're at when we uh, s sort of took our eye, put our eye onto other things. Um, I think Jonathan may have his hand up or he had got his hand up briefly before I started to answer. I don't know if Jonathan wants to add. Um, uh, you've you've answered the question perfectly, oh. Peter, from a from a emergency preparedness point of view. And I've just put a little note in the comments. Um, but um, we're, we're we're as prepared as we were. The the plans are still on the shelf, um, ready to go. We're not being asked about it by regulators at the moment. And and all I'd say is, if anything was going to test our um, resilience and emergency response in terms of preparedness um you couldn't have asked for a better year to, pre to prepare us <laughs> to be quite honest um so um i think in many respects brexit from an operational point of view will be easy, much easier much much easier than covid um from from our own organization point of view i mean a quick one from me phil i mean are we affected on drugs at all by a no deal brexit um, all our drugs, um, Phil, are sourced through um, the supplies um, through UH&M, through our suppliers, um, I, I believe. And um, no, we were very specifically in the last lead up to exit date told not to stockpile drugs. There were drugs being held centrally in the country um, that we could access and it was being taken care of on a national basis um, and that any change in prescribing practice would be communicated to us centrally. Right. Thank you. Got to be very cautious in making comments of this sort, but uh, what one is entitled to rely on central action on, on, on drug supply and a whole raft of other things uh, that may be come into short supply, uh, recruitment not, not being the least of them. Um, uh, one's entitled to rely to some extent on on central government action in relation to these things. Uh, but, but, but there must be a tendency on our part to go as far down the road as we can with putting our plans in order uh, and our supplies secured uh, without re relying on, on central government uh, as far as we're able to. I think we've probably learned that lesson. That's uh, so as far as I dare go with that. Um, shall we? Shall we move on then? Unless anybody else has got their hands up, and I don't think they have.